Welcome back, Linda. It's great to have you back, but don't worry, Sue did a great job in your absence. I know she did. Many thanks to Sue for filling in for me. I see that you finished up in the last episode with wondering where some of the schools got their very interesting names. We should call this episode, Who Named Those Schools Anyway? Yeah. <laughs> and in this episode, we are focused on Moldy, Bighorn, and Valhalla schools. They are about 50 kilometers northwest of Grand Prairie. Let's start with Ray Winnegar's reading from Mary Nutting's book on Moldy School. Who in the world would call their school moldy? <laughs> Ray will fill us in. Moldy School District, named after Molda, Norway, was organized by July 30th, 1917, for the Norwegian community at Valhalla School. School opened January 2nd, 1918 in the Stang home with 31 students taught by Lena Homey. They invited school inspector, Mr. Farr, to the opening program. His assessment was that it was great, that even the parents participated, but that three hours was too long. When the 24 foot by 36 foot school was built in 1919, the district imposed a two-day labor levy on each ratepayer to work the grounds, build the school, build the chimney, and finish off the interior. The school was maintained by the community, not the government. In 1922, they hauled lumber from Buffalo Lakes Lumber Company to build a school barn, and in 1926, there was a work bee to put in a new floor supplied by the community, paint the interior, dig the well, and install a pump provided by the Valhalla Women's Institute. They also had a horse-drawn school van operated by Carl Dolomo. Running a one-room school was expensive, so there were many ways a school board could rack up debt. The school grant was 20 cents per day per student, and if you owed any wages to the teacher, this grant was mailed directly to him or her. In 1926, they finally paid a debt to Lena Larson for service in 1918. In 1936, they dealt with arrears and taxes by asking the teacher to board with taxpayers who were in arrears. Her pay for board was then applied to that person's taxes. Enrollment at Moldy during the 1930s hovered around 30 students. At that time, it was more acceptable for teachers to be single. In 1934, with 29 in grades one to nine, the board moved and passed that we ask Mrs. P.H. Krauss for her resignation as teacher of the school on grounds that we do not approve of a married teacher. Perhaps a competent single teacher could not be found because she was still teaching in December of that year. The school fair was an important event at Moldy, and their students did very well. On November 3rd, 1932, the paper reported that Mrs. Sheila Falconer, Moldy School, won the special prize for school exhibits, including penmanship, science, art, at school fair held at Valhalla Center. She received a set of seven leather-bound books from the Department of Education. And again, on February 2nd, 1933, the teacher and pupils of Moldy are rejoicing over the two diplomas, that, diplomas they have received. One was the agricultural diploma for having the largest number of points in agricultural exhibits at the school fair. The other was for having the largest number of points for school work. By 1940, Moldy was part of the Grand Prairie School Division number 14, and decisions such as hiring teachers and repairing buildings were then the responsibility of the division. In 1941, Ray Dolomo moved a teacherage onto the grounds, but in 1946, it was decided that the entire school needed to be replaced. A new site, donated by G.A. Olson, was chosen on the northwest corner 
of the Northwest 32, 74, 10, 6. And by spring 1947, the new school was ready. By 1951, students from Moldy were attending the consolidated school at Valhalla Centre. In 1954, the school district was disbanded and the ratepayers were given representation on the Valhalla School Board. The school buildings were retained by the school committee for community use, but in 1959, the county sold the buildings to the Emmanuel Ladies' Aid of the Evangelical Lutheran Church. The land reverted to Gust Olson, who had originally donated the three acres for a school site. And we are so fortunate to have a wonderful interview with Elvira Gotkowski, who was a student at Moldy School. Elvira became a teacher and was very inspiring to me as a new teacher over 45 years ago. Her son was kind enough to do this interview in 2020. I went to school uh, in Moldy. I started school when I was seven and went there until I almost finished grade eight. Seven people in my uh, grade. Well, I started with those seven people in 1939, and uh, those same seven people were still in my uh, uh, class, same class uh, when I quit there. We younger kids uh, in the elementary grade learned a lot of stuff by osmosis, just by listening to the teacher talking to the older grades. The straight pens we had where they supplied us with the nibs that went in little ink wells. And the teacher would measure out so many teaspoons of this powder into a jug of pre-measured water and shook it up and that was our ink. I can still remember all over the floor, all over our papers, our biggest uh, goal or accomplishment often was to have a whole page of written work without a single ink cloth on it. Lunches brought to school in the syrup pail or an old lard pail and uh, often uh, it was packed to the brim with three or four of the siblings uh, sharing the same lunch box. Uh, our lunches were very meager. You have to remember we were, of course, all Depression-era kids, and my parents were immigrant farmers. We had very little. Our lunches consisted mostly of peanut butter and syrup sandwiches. And you can imagine in the wintertime, they froze, and in the summer, uh, they got too hot and too dry. And if we were very lucky, we had a part of an orange or a part of an apple, never a whole apple, but maybe a quarter or sometimes a half. Uh, that was our usual fare. And some kids even had their lunch in the, uh, a sugar sack, a small little uh, soft sack, wax paper, uh, baggies, forget it. Mother would say once the cereal boxes came uh, uh, into vogue, uh, and we had, you know, how the cereal boxes came with the, um, or the uh, the cereal itself was in this wax liner uh, inside the cardboard box. Well, that wax liner became very, very precious, and it was recycled long before that firm came to uh, into popular use. Uh, during the winters at school. We had to provide a, a few shekels to buy cocoa and sugar, and then we took turns bringing milk from home to make cocoa at school. Uh, those who could afford it, uh, at some point, brought a quarter a month, I believe, so that the teacher could buy canned tomatoes and she would make a tomato milk soup but uh, we were never able to participate in that because we couldn't afford that kind of money. So, and then another teacher that really impressed me was my grade 11 teacher, uh, grade 10, 11, and 12 social studies teacher in high school. Mr. McNeil had just come home. He had been in the war 
a pilot in the war. And he knew of so many places that we, he spoke of in his lectures at school. And it was just a joy to listen to him, to hear firsthand some of his exploits. Another teacher, again, I referred to this, Miss Hodge, she was very special. She had the older kids uh, write uh, letters to the soldiers. Uh, I think he sent them all to the Red Cross and then the Red Cross distributed them to uh, uh, soldiers. I do know that they were sent and were appreciated by the soldiers who didn't have a lot of uh, uh, communication with their homes. Those were some of the things that I remember. And then, of course, as I said, the victory dance he did uh, on, the, on the road. I remember coming to school that day and here was he saw the column there on the road, the war is over, the war is over, and uh, it was very, and a very exciting time. So, uh, yeah, the World War did impact us by quite a bit. There are so many strong connections between Moldy School and Valhalla School, and the person doing the next reading from Mary's book may be familiar. In March 1913, a group of Norwegian immigrant families filed on land northeast of Haif and named the new settlement Valhalla. This was to be their Norse heaven. After their homes were built, they turned their attention to the education of their children, and Valhalla School District number 3130 was established May 14th 1914. Classes began immediately for 16 students in Olaf Horde's house with university student Nelius Ronning as teacher for the summer. Attempts to attract a full-time teacher were not successful and the next year Nelius taught another summer session, this time in the large Ronning house as there were now 22 students. Meanwhile, the new school board organized a group of men to cut and haul logs for a building. Shingles and lumber were purchased from the Buffalo Lakes Lumber Company. And in the summer of 1915, community members built a log school on the southwest corner of section 1874-9W6. This new school opened just after New Year's 1916 with Alvy Baycroft as teacher. There was no teacher each, so teachers boarded out or used part of the school as their living quarters. One of Valhalla's early teachers was Chester Ronning, who became a famous Canadian diplomat. He taught at Valhalla after he graduated from the University of Alberta in 1916, then spent five years as a missionary in China. In 1927, he returned to Canada to serve first as the principal of Camrose Lutheran College, then as an MLA in the UFA government. In 1945, he began a diplomatic career which took him to China, Norway, India, and the United Nations. In 1972, he was named a Companion of the Order of Canada. In 1925, Valhalla and Moldy school districts consolidated for a short time, and a second room was added to Valhalla School. The arrangement was that Moldy pupils would attend Valhalla for the sum of 90 cents per day plus the use of the moldy school equipment. This lasted until 1929, when Valhalla reverted back to one room. By 1943, enrollment was again increasing, and a new two-room school was built. In 1951, the newly formed County of Grand Prairie took over the running of schools within its borders. With the closing of the one-room country schools, Valhalla School became a central facility. Three rooms were opened in 1951, and in 1954, a six-room school was erected, about one quarter of a mile east of the original log schoolhouse. 
A gymnasium was added to the school in 1964. In 1960, the decision was made to van the high school students at Valhalla to Hythe. Ten years later, the junior high students were sent to Hythe and the high school students rerouted to Beaver Lodge. Valhalla Center School then became an elementary school. For 48 years, the elementary school continued to operate under County and Peace Wapiti School Divisions. When closures threatened due to low enrollment, the community applied for and received charter status and continued to operate under their own board of directors. Valhalla School still exists in modern form on the northeast corner of the intersection of Highway 59 and Secondary Highway 723 in the hamlet of Valhalla Center. I loved hearing about Chester Ronning. My dad knew him. Our next reading is about Bighorn School and it is read by Liz Good Tiro. The Bighorn School District was organized on October 9, 1915 for the Scenic Heights District north of Wembley. By then, classes had already been taught for a year, mostly in the summer, by Professor Emery Keith in the Methodist Church on Southeast 1673-8 west of the 6th. Although slates were used in lieu of paper, the pupils had the advantage of Mr. Keith's extensive library, which he housed at the church. When the church burned down in 1919, Mr. Keith's library was also lost. School continued in various homes throughout the district. A school was finally built in 1920 after a battle over the location of the school caused the whole board to resign. A tender appeared in the August 24, 1920 Grand Prairie Herald. Sealed tenders will be received by the Board of Trustees of School District Number 3312 Niobe at the Office of Secretary Treasurer up until noon of September 10, 1920 for the erection of a school building. Plans and specifications may be obtained from the Secretary Treasurer on payment of $5, which will be returned on receipt of a bona fide tender with plans and specifications. The lowest or any tender will not necessarily be accepted. Dated Lake Saskatoon, August 7, 1920, Yuri Powell, Secretary Treasurer. Once built, the school became the center of the community with UFA meetings, church services, and frequent dances. The wood supply was contracted out to surrounding settlers and the water supply was Bear Creek until a well was drilled on site. There was also a teacherage and a barn. A Christmas concert was the main event of the year. A platform was cobbled together for a stage and the ladies sent sheets for curtains. A community collection funded preschooler gifts and school children drew names for a gift exchange. All the children received treat bags at the concert. By 1929, there were too many children for one school. And since the district was so large, a new school district was created to the west called Meadowville. This left in 1931, still 27 children at Bighorn. The top attendance was 42 in 1937. And despite the large classes, teachers usually received high marks from the superintendents. Sports were important at Bighorn. Although there was no money from the government for equipment, in a 1934 note, Inspector Balfour gave some solutions. Quote, the proximity of the community hall and the new skating rink and the evidence of lively interest in sport lead me to suggest that some means of providing some equipment such as jumping standards with a supply of crossbars, proper takeoffs for broad jump and hop step and jump, poles for pole vault, ring and shot for shot put, and measured distances on the road might develop some fine athletes and be good for community as well as school." Unquote. In 1951, Bighorn School closed and the students were bused to the centralized school at La Glass. The school building became the home of the Oddman Hoxted family north of La Glass. And the following is a letter written by Fred Howlett, who was the teacher of Bighorn School in 1934, to H.E. Balfour, who was inspector of schools. Dear Sir, I am planning to have an inter-school sports day here at Scenic Heights on Friday of June 1st. The following schools are going to take part. Canuck, Meadowville, La Glace, and Bighorn. Some of the teachers are asking if a day uh, spent in field or track sports could be counted as a regular school day, the same as attendance at a school fair. As I am not very familiar with the provisions of the School Act, I would be grateful if you could inform me about this matter. I trust I am not making too heavy demands on your time in asking this. And this was May 11th, 1934. Interesting. Are you wondering how Bighorn School got its name? I think I have someone who can tell us about that. Two years ago, my friend Lola Wright helped me get in touch with her sister, Lola Stefaniak, and their aunt, Maisie Paquette, 
who was a student at Bighorn School. We are honored to have this interview. By the way, Aunt Maisie is now 99 years old and doing really well. Thanks for having the discussion with me this afternoon on the history of the Bighorn School. And when did you go to the Bighorn School? 1930. Your dad named the Bighorn School. Do you have any idea where he would have gotten that name from? I think from the United States with the Bighorn Sheep. He went on a trip to San Francisco. Yes, he took a load of um, buffalo to the World's Fair. I think I remember hearing a, a funny story about after school, going out to the barn to get your horses. And uh, maybe there was one student who always wanted to get out out first. I, I kind of remember that story. Can you share that story with me, Maisie? That's a good story. That's true. Lots of fun he was. He lived close to the school. He always would do uh, the last recess and he'd get up his, uh, his jacket. He'd put his jacket right beside his desk and uh, he had his, his uh, bag on his on the, uh, his arms through his bag. So all he had to do was grab his jacket and get out the door into the barn. Because he was always first out, he was first out the, out the gate. I guess I was full of the old Nick anyway. I thought to myself, I'm going to fix him. He's not going to get out first tomorrow. So I went in the barn and I tied knots and knots and knots where he had his horse tied up. And so he sure wasn't first that day. <laughs> <laughs> did he find out that you did it? <laughs> Maisie, it's been really fun listening to you share your memories of Bighorn School. And I'm sure the people that are going to get to hear them are going to really enjoy it too. And I, I think it's so nice to know that that you at your age um, can recall the things that you can and the detail you can. It's absolutely wonderful. So we're lucky to have you as a historian uh, for the Bighorn School. So is there anything you'd like to share with anybody who's going to listen to this? That I really loved. I just loved going to Bighorn School. And I have nothing but good things to say. Bighorn School. I really appreciated what Lois said about recording memories of our school days so that we can share them with our children and grandchildren. And we're doing just that. We hope you enjoyed this wonderful bit of history and we look forward to seeing you again in our next episode 8 which is about Flying Shot Lake School. And guess where we will be filming it? You're right, the A&W. See you then. We acknowledge that we live and film on Treaty 8 territory, the ancestral and present day home to many diverse First Nations, Métis and Inuit people. We are grateful to work, live and learn on the traditional territory of Duncan First Nation, Horse Lake First Nation and Sturgeon Lake Cree Nation, who are the original caretakers of this land. We acknowledge the history of this land and we are thankful for the opportunity to walk together in friendship where we will encourage and promote positive change for present and future generations. That is a very special and meaningful statement for us and for our project.